What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host Adam Mades, and I'm joined, as always, by Tim Legler. Legs, how you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I, you know, we had we had some you know, t- typical NBA work last night, but I'm not going to lie to you. I was pretty glued to those women's games first, man. Knowing I could uh, record the NBA and watch it later, I didn't want to miss the women's games live. I was so into that last night. So it's uh, if you're a hoop fan, it's it's been a pretty pretty uh, awesome time of year and and usually we're talking ncaa tournament and then you know men and then nba but now man this women's game has become the talk of the town it really has ratings have been great the game was phenomenal lived up to the hype both in terms of you know intrigue but also intensity so it'll be fun to get to that one we're going to start today by talking about the pelicans and the suns both of them had interesting takeaways i'm excited to get legs take on those we're also going to talk quickly about the bulls and the hawks and we'll move on to caitlin clark and the rest of the women's slate before finishing up by talking about now that we have a week and a half left in the season we can start to look at the most intriguing battles because there's still a lot hanging in the balance and we'll kind of talk about the most interesting battles that we have there but first we are presented as as always, by DraftKings Sportsbook. Stay tuned. Later in the show, you're going to hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, let's get into it. Let's start with the game of the night, at least what was the game of the night in the NBA for me, which was the Suns defeating the Pel- Pelicans in New Orleans, 124-111. to How did they beat them? No big deal. Devin Booker just goes for 52. Third straight time <laughs> scoring 50 points against the Pelicans. Like, some guys just have a team's number. Like, you yeah. see this from time to time. Three straight 50-point games, that's better than having a, a team's number. That, that's something else. Yeah, and it's a little different than the uh, the three straight triple doubles at the Garden Josh Giddy had. You know, that's <laughs> another one of those weird anomalies, right? This is <laughs> this is like going for big numbers that are very hard to replicate. Um, you know, and they, they, they attributed some of that in the broadcast I was watching. I was listening to the Pelicans broadcast, my buddy Joel Myers on the call with Antonio Daniels. Um, one and they attributed some broadcast. of that. Yeah, yeah, they attributed some of that to the fact that he's, I guess, got roots in the area and he's got 40 to 50 people at the game every time he comes in and it gets, gives them some extra adrenaline. I didn't know anything about that. That's true. Great. He should just pay those people to travel everywhere they go um, <laughs> and sit in every road arena because he, he got smoking early. Now, look, he's a great scorer and a great player, and he definitely – he sees the chum in the water, man, when he gets it going. Very few guys get as hungry as Devin Booker when he hits some shots early. But I will say this. There was very little resistance in the first six minutes of the game for him. And you would think a guy that has torched him a couple of times, you know, it's not like you're, you're you know, you're, this is within a series where he had 50 straight. They're spread out, these performances you're talking about. But still, he's got to be a, on, 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 like top of your radar because of how quickly he can catch fire and the problem you have once he does. And I just thought he walked into some shots, man. He walked into to some mid-range shots early off ball screens where the defender was way back. I mean, you're talking about pull up 15, 18 foot jumpers, one of the best scorers in the league. And then he had a couple yeah. of threes in transition where they had an opportunity. I thought the fan out to him and they elected not to. And, and the Suns made the right play and got it to him. So he got he got absolutely smoking early. And it carried pretty much the entire half. You know, he missed a three at the buzzer at the end of the half, or he's got a 40-point half that he would have just hung on the Pelicans. So, yeah. yeah, it's a great night, great player, playing great, but I, you have to look at it the other way as well. I just thought the Pelicans' approach was nowhere near enough uh, of a state of readiness t- to deal with the Suns in general and, and Devin Booker specifically. Well, we, you know, our favorite word that a coach can call a team, soft, Creeped up last night with regards to Devin Booker. Willie Green said, we were soft in our coverage against him. We would not take that challenge. And so we've talked about it. That's one of the, when you're going to that, a coach usually is feeling really pissed off or really desperate or perhaps both. The Pelicans dropping 
looking for this crucial moment, you know, down the stretch of the season. Maybe he's feeling a little bit of pressure, feeling a little bit of uh, frustration with his team because this was a huge game. I mean, you look at the standings and these two teams are, you know, they're they're right there with each other. Uh, 30 losses now for the Pels, 31 for the Suns. So they're right there. This game meant a lot. And to give up a 50 point game to a guy that, you know, has been going off against you is a big deal. But I'm going to look at it. You're going to look at it from that side. And I think it's fair. And we can talk more about it. Dyson Daniels coming back, his second game back. He's a guy that you expect should have a better impact, and he did not last night. But I'm going to look at it from the other perspective and say, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, the reason you can't fully sell the Suns, at least in my opinion, even if you don't like their setup, you don't like their uh, their the way they play, the style, or any of that, the reason you can't fully sell them is Devin Booker and Kevin Durant reach levels where it doesn't matter what you do, they just don't miss. And Devin Booker did it, obviously, in the playoffs last year, even in a losing effort against Denver. But nights like last night, those shots are no hopers for a defense, some of them, where it's just like... I don't know what you do. His shot it has the high arc. He elevates so well on it, and he just gets in a rhythm where you feel like everything is going in, and he was in that rhythm last night, and it's meaningful because we're getting close to the playoffs. If he starts to stack games like this together, it changes the way you view the Suns, in my opinion. Well, look, I can tell you this about Devin Booker. There, look, there's plenty of nights where Devin Booker misses his first four or five shots or has a slow start and still gets 30, and yeah. is dominant like in the fourth quarter, whatever he needs to be. Sure, certainly those nights happen. But I can guarantee you when he walks into the shots he walked into in the first six, eight minutes of this game, <laughs> I, I'm, I know how that's going to go. Like, give yeah. me a script. I'll write the script for you. Here's exactly what's about to happen with Devin Booker. Now, the only way that you can, you know, I guess try to slow that down is then you just run extra traffic at him. You take the ball out of his hands. You make sure you absolutely make sure you're running with him in transition. And all that's going to lead to is other wide open stuff. That that means that like Durant maybe gets more space, or more likely, guys like Grayson Allen all of a sudden or Eric Gordon walk into wide open shots, or Nurkic gets slips because you're yeah. you're fanning out too soon and he just dives to the rim. Like there's going to be other stuff there, but it's all predicated on the start that he has. So you look for Phoenix, I look at them. And I've been hard on them. We know that. I mean, you know, we talk. I'm not going to revisit these losses they had against the Bucks and Spurs. We know about that. Well documented. Um, they're just – something about them is just not hitting at max capacity. And I look at – last night, for instance, it, it, I think this is part of it. They have a very difficult time, like, sharing the load equally amongst the three guys. Mm. It, you know, Bradley Beal, this was his seventh consecutive game without getting 20 points. Now, you might think, well, oh, wow. hey, look, somebody somebody's going to sacrifice. Well, come on, mm -hmm. man. This isn't this isn't Chris Bosh going to the heat and basically changing the his entire style of play. He went from a a, a back to the basket player, a short iso player in Toronto as the main option every trip to basically a pick and pop elbow and three-point shooter as a big guy for the heat and never got post touch-ups. Post up uh post up touches. So he completely changed. You know that's going to happen. Kevin Love did the same thing. He went from being right. the first out of Minnesota to being a supplementary sort of spot-up three-point shooter in Cleveland. No one asked Bradley Beal to change up. He's not running point guard. I mean, Bradley Beal is equally as capable as Devin Booker is heating up. This guy averaged over 30 points a game in a season. And I feel like they haven't really figured out how to stagger the moments in the games for these guys while at the same time, like kind of playing together. Cause there is two different components to it where they're all hitting. And I, and I think that's Bradley Beal right now feels like the lap, the, the guy that's left out. And, and here's my point, Adam, last night, Bradley Beal's first shot of the game was at the buzzer at the end of the first quarter. Right. Now you're talking about a guy on that <laughs> level as an offensive talent that play. And I know, look, I understand Booker was hot. Fine. You have you 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 do not let starters, period, go an entire quarter without getting a shot. I mean, my goodness, the first five minutes of every NBA game, I feel like every player on the court gets a shot. It's almost a handshake agreement. All right, everybody loose now, everybody get one up. Okay, let's start playing. That's kind of how the NBA works in the beginning. But but when you have a guy like this that is this good at scoring the basketball to take his first shot as the horn goes off at the end of the first quarter. I don't understand the Suns had 46 points. They had a big league. Great. They played a great quarter. Booker was sensational. But that's not the point. The point is, can they figure out a way that this shot distribution 
is a little bit more even because I think I don't feel like Bradley Beal is close to max level that he needs to be for the Suns to make convince me that they're a legitimate challenger in the West. And I saw it again last night. I think one of the things you're hinting at here is it's a 46 point quarter. I mean, you can't say this is a bad thing, but no, there are there are teams that when they have a 40 point quarter, it's often because the ball was popping. There, there was the synergy. Maybe there was a two man game going, or the ball was moving, and they're just in this great flow state as a team, as a collective. With the Suns, it reminds me in many ways of the Iverson Mellow Nuggets. You know, team. You know, my team from back in the day, where it was often like, oh man, Iverson's on fire, and he's on fire for a half. And whenever that dries up, or whenever you try to go something else, there's not a rhythm to it. It's okay. Now we have to completely break from it. And I think that's what you're pointing out. So when it's, so when a player like Devin Booker is great for four quarters then you're going to win a game and you're going to get 124 points. But if he's hot for two quarters and then it's like, okay, now we need to find some else team makes an adjustment. Then there isn't, we almost have to reestablish the, the identity of the team and, and the flow of the team. And I think that's what probably what you're hint, hinting at. And the Pelicans last night defensively, you know, to Willie Green's point, I didn't think one, they made great adjustments on Devin Booker and two, he never felt uncomfortable. So he never got knocked out of that rhythm. And as a result, you get this great performance from the, from uh, Devin Booker. One thing though, to push back from you. And I think it had a lot to do with how Pelicans guarded, guarded them. I thought they had a lot of good ball reversals in this game. And that's one of the things, if you watch the Suns and just think about how many times does the ball touch the left side of the court, and the right side of the court, they probably are on a short list of teams that are in the bottom I don't know, four or five teams in the NBA in terms of ball reversals. It just shows that they don't move the ball a lot. Last night, they had a lot of those. They had a lot of skip passes and just getting the ball back and forth. So you're getting a scrambled defense, and then you can attack off of that. And that stood out to me because it's something they need. I think that's a great point. I think it's absolutely accurate. I actually made a note of that when I was watching the game because the two things that stand out to me when the Suns play really well offensively is one, what you just said, they don't become one side heavy. The yep. ball ends up on both sides of the court, and sometimes it'll change sides twice on the same possession. That's first. And then the number of touches that they get into the middle of the floor, whether that is the primary ball handler getting into the paint or to at least to the foul line area, or that's a pass to a Nurkic or a Eubanks, or we saw the other night with Thaddeus Young doing it. It's a pick dive and the ball goes in there because two guys are always going to be extended on these ball screens for the most part when it's talking about Durant and Booker especially. Yeah. So the ball goes in there. Now you force a chain reaction to communicate what's going to happen next. And you got to trust those guys. And I feel like the inclusion of those guys makes their offense very difficult to guard. Unfortunately, they don't play like that all the time. And they don't get the ball reversals all the time. I agree with you last night. The ball did change sides of the floor nicely. I also think that the Pelicans – Yep. made it obvious that that's what had to happen because I felt like they were late on their closeouts. That I did not think at all that they were connected to guys in the way that they should be. They were too far off to the ball. They were late getting back into the play. So it was an easy decision to move it one more pass to the next guy who's going to have a wide open shot. Sometimes that's murkier with teams, and you have to throw that pass anyway, even if the guy is guarded, because it will then lead to something else. All right, more action is going to come off of that. And sometimes the Suns don't do that. They take the first decent available opportunity from one of those scorers on one side of the floor, and it makes them a little bit more guardable. So I think you're, you make a good point. They did do that last night. I actually noted it during the game. And there's one other piece of this that I think was a, a contributing factor, and that is this specific matchup. The Pelicans are a little soft in the middle, especially with defensive rebounding, especially when Zion is trying to play big. Nurkic is a phenomenal offensive rebounder, and he knows that his most important role is that on this team is to really create that offensive rebound gravity to where you're always nervous about it. So one, I agree with Willie Green. I thought they were soft in terms of their on-ball pressure. I think you got to pressure Devin Booker and Bradley Beal and try to make them give up the ball early so you can have those rotations. And two, you've got to keep Nurkic out of the paint because – they were so bothered by him, and on the times when they did scramble, Nurk was grabbing all the offensive rebounds. So I thought those two things are not, you know, not always the ball movement, not always a, a strength for the Suns. But Nurkic's pressure on the rim in this game, I thought, allowed for better ball movement. And I don't know if it is a matchup thing. I don't think these two teams will end up playing, but it is one of those things where you say, okay, that's a Pelicans weakness and a Suns strength, and it really influenced the texture of this game. I yeah, I think that's a good point. And Nurkic is amazing to me. The number of games I've watched him this year where 
it's incredible how fast he gets to like 10 rebounds. Yep. <laughs> you know, you'll like you'll note it on the broadcast. Like you're eight minutes in, and there's his tenth rebound of the game. You're like, man, oh man. Like for some guys, man, that's 38 minutes of work to get to that. Nurkic does it so easily. He had eight offensive rebounds um, by himself in this game. 19 overall. Uh, he's a massive factor for them, and he's a better fit than DeAndre Ayton was, in my opinion. There's there's no doubt about it. Some of the things he's willing to do and willing to do all the time, or some of the yeah. things that DeAndre Ayton struggled with a little bit. And Nurkic is a better fit for that reason. This is going to come down to one thing. Look, I, I said in the beginning, I didn't think you needed to be great defensively anymore to contend. I, and I still believe you don't need to be great, but you need to be better than average. You need to be like decent and you need to be able to re- be good to great when you need to in one possession games. Like this is a big possession. Let's lock in. Can we execute that with our personnel and game plan? So I, it's not like you could be some porous sieve team defensively and be a contender, but Let's be honest, man. This is an offense-driven league. And if the Suns figure out their offensive flow with consistency to max out those three guys and and the role players around them and how they fit the roles, the Suns would be in that category of contender. I I just – I haven't seen it consistently enough to include them in that. And I think – I haven't really seen too many people talking about the Suns when you start talking about what your expectations are for the postseason. And, and who could end up in the conference finals and finals. They don't get mentioned much. I'm not saying that I'm writing them off, but I got to see more. It's got to be more consistent offensive flow, similar to what I saw last night, the last three quarters. Um, and that'll convince me maybe as we get time to actually lace them up in a best of seven. Let's move over to the Pelican side because I think they're, for me at least, they were the most in, more interesting team in defeat last night because – I have a couple questions about them, and we've talked, we've gone back and forth about the Pelicans. They've had hot streaks and cold streaks. We love their roster, especially the depth of it. They have a lot of interesting role players. They have a tragic flaw to their roster, and that is how you pair the center position with Zion. And last night, I thought that one was especially obvious, in part because you could tell Willie Green was reaching. They played some minutes last night in the fourth quarter that with Valanchunas uh, and Larry Nance Jr. together, that lineup got murdered. You bring in Zion to be a small ball center. Then so you swing the other direction from two bigs to now just Zion at center. You're playing small ball. And they made a comeback there, but that lineup is so vulnerable to defensive rebounding. They give up offense second chance points. And it almost felt like they had two tragically flawed options that both provided strengths but equal weaknesses and i've seen that a lot from this pelicans team and that's one of the things that as we start to go into the playoffs when you have a vulnerability like that you're so susceptible to a team being able to take advantage of it last night phoenix was and it made the pelicans look terrible well and it it, it, you know i'm glad i was listening to the pelicans broadcast on this because i thought they were really really pointing that out and they're, they're the two guys that call every one of their games, right? So they're seeing this every night. And they know when they get into that bogged down territory. And that, that that's what it felt like beginning of the game. The spacing was, just wasn't good enough. And what happens is you get Zion bottled up like that. When the spacing isn't good enough for him, he's having a very difficult time like imposing his force on the game. I didn't notice Zion in the first quarter of the game. I didn't, I didn't notice he was on the court. Right. And that just can't happen. You're missing Brandon Ingram, C.J. McCollum, is out there with you, but this thing's going to be now basically driven by Zion. He's the guy that's going to put the pressure on the defense to create opportunities for himself and other people. Didn't really notice him at the start of the game, and a lot of it had to do with the way Phoenix was just completely clogging the lane in the exact area of the floor that Zion needs to get to. And it was a factor in the game. It was a factor in the slow start, and as a result, you look up, you're in an 18-point hole that you're not digging out of especially when you know, now you've had a guy in Phoenix, one of their top guys was absolutely on fire at that point. Another thing about Zion that's interesting, and I don't, I'm don't, i curious where you fall on this, because Zion and Giannis are very comparable, and we talk about the center position. I want to go back to that here in a second. Brooke Lopez rebounds, he defends, and he shoots the three, so he provides the space for Giannis to get to the paint. You know, Big Val doesn't do that. He provides some rebounding. He provides some size, but he's not going to space the floor properly the way uh, Brooke Lopez does. So I do think that around Zion, you're probably going to have to find a really tough center that does very specific things to to pair next to him, and that's going to be a a challenge in the offseason. But one difference between those two guys, and somebody in in New Orleans brought this to my attention, my guy Christian Clark, Giannis will take a mid-range a game maybe two mid-ranges a game. Not It's not a great shot. He's not hunting for it, but he's willing to take them. 
because it's sometimes necessary to. Right. Zion will never do it. He'll never do it. And if you yeah. look out in the season at Zion's shot chart and just like where he takes shot from shots from, 0.4 per game from 10 to 14 feet. And he has not taken on more than, I think, two or three from 15 to 19 feet. Again, these are not good shots. But there's a difference between that's a bad shot, stop hunting it, and are you willing to take it when you need to? And he seems to be, like, completely unwilling to even take them. I agree. And, it, you know, I thought I thought he was going to be able to extend it out there. Because here's the thing. he's going. He would be able to, in the course of a game, take – and he's never going to be super high volume. Let's just say he took three of those a game. Let's just say, right? They're all going to be completely unguarded. Mm. That's the thing. He'll have all the time he wants. No one's going to come running out at Zion on a ball reversal, on a closeout, right? You're, you're not going to do that because you're going to absolutely be susceptible to him beating you, and now he's at the rim, and there's no stopping him once he takes off. So you're going to you're going to close out, if at all, slowly, he can take as much time as he wants, shoot a little set shot if you want to, whatever whatever you want to do, but he doesn't really even look at the rim anymore. And I, he did more when he first came into the league, and he really doesn't do that anymore. So I agree with you. And I don't look, I, I think you get to a certain point. I'm not saying he'll never do it, but I think it's something that'll be harder for him. Look, DeMar DeRozan had this problem for a while, and DeMar DeRozan changed and he added it, right? Because it was important because it's tough to survive – making mid-range twos and free throws. When when you've got other teams that you're playing and their top guys potentially could go make four or five threes in a given night if that's what it means. And all the top teams have players capable of doing that. So I think it's something that he, he still has time to add, but the fact that it hasn't really improved at all, it's regressed actually from the time he came into the league in terms of his just willingness to do it. Uh, I, I agree. It, it, it's a little bit concerning, but that's not the biggest – Problem I have with Zion. Um, I don't understand his rebounding numbers. I know. He's so bad at it. I don't understand it. So last night is an example. Two rebounds in the game. The Phoenix Suns missed 44 shots. He had one defensive rebound. He is one of the strongest, most powerful athletes in this league. He had one offensive rebound, and they missed 47 shots on their end. He doesn't have the willingness to go. Offensive rebounding, if he's anywhere in the middle area of the floor, he's he's getting back. And I don't know if that's, you know, hey, maybe they've told him because, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a long run for a big guy. You know, if you go to the glass, don't get it, man. Are you going to put us in a, a compromised position in transition defense? Maybe that's why he doesn't do it. I don't think that's it, man. I, I, I think I think because there are guys, take a look at Giannis. Giannis is at the elbow when a shot's taken. He's crashing the glass full speed, and then he's going to be in a full sprint getting back. It's just called it's just called effort. So for his rebounding numbers to be what they are, to almost never get double-digit rebounds for a guy that, that is that big, strong, and athletic doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So for comparison, I just was like, just looked it up. I just picked a guy on the Phoenix Suns. I picked Grayson Allen. Grayson Allen is a... Spot up shooting specialist offensively. He does more than that. So I don't I shouldn't call him a specialist because I really like his game. But you know what I mean. That's the majority of where he stands offensively. And he's a two guard defensively. He's he's had 69 games he's played this year. 67 of those games, he's had two or more rebounds. You know, <laughs> Dion had two rebounds last night. This is your that's starting crazy. power forward. This is a guy that's playing in the paint all the time. And he just doesn't really impact the game in that way. And there's two ways you could do it. Finishing off defensive possessions by securing a defensive rebound. That's part of team defense. And he's not a great defender. That could be a way he could contribute more to team defense. And then offensively, it gives your team more, more opportunities. And guess what? That's going to require a little effort, man. Going after some of the ones where you're in the gray area and running in trying to get the ball. If you don't get it, are you willing to sprint back and get ahead of the basketball? And maybe he's not. So that's, for me, has always been the thing I've looked at with Zion, and I just don't get the rebounding numbers for an athlete like this. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I love the the idea of the offensive rebound in particular. He should be great at these. And there are players that, that are in that mold. And Giannis is one of them. 
Aaron Gordon's another guy where they're so athletic and they're so quick with the second jump that it, it's, it's, it's its own weapon. You throw the ball up at the rim and you just are the quickest and first one to get back in. You're so strong. And a guy like Nurk, if there's a problem with Nurkic, so last night's a perfect example. If there's this flaw in Nurkic's game defensively, he fouls a lot. Yeah. You draw a lot of fouls off of offensive rebounds. You, you're going hard at it. That's that's a prime opportunity to draw them. But you have to put it in your head that that's what you're going to do. One other thought, though, on Zion with this specific thing. I thought the Suns did a great job going way under on screens with Zion. I mean, they were – it was almost comical yeah. how much – every time there was a pick and roll, they would take 10 steps backwards, be right in the paint, and then you know attack after after that. And I was surprised and maybe even disappointed in the Pelicans because I didn't think they countered that very well. But it is another thing that I thought this is the complication of some of the lineups that the Pelicans want to play is you can get away with really packing the paint on pick and rolls with Zion. It takes away a lot of the effectiveness. Completely agree. They did. You're 100% right. It was an over-exaggeration of that last night <laughs> to such an extent. Um, and look. This was not necessarily the best game to analyze them because it got out of hand quickly. Yep. And it ch it changes the dynamic thing. 20-point leads are a race regularly in this league. It's hard, though, when you're not only you're down 20, you gave up 46 points in the first half, and, and it's like everything's unleashed. It's hard to rein that back in. And so this is not necessarily the best game to because your mentality around certain things change. So, I, But I think the statements you and I are making are more generalizations that we've seen yeah, and observed sure. over the course of the year in how we evaluate the New Orleans Pelicans relative to this playoff race we have going on in the West because we don't talk about them a ton. This was a good opportunity to kind of hone in and see where they're at. Now, you don't have Brandon Ingram. It's a big deal. I get it. He hasn't played in two weeks. And he is an answer for a lot of things offensively because of his length and shooting ability. But then that's more opportunity to really kind of analyze other guys and how is their ability to, to you know, add to their game if they're missing a guy to overcome that. And unfortunately, we never got to that point last night because the Suns took it to them so early and they got, they got cooking so fast. Yeah. The last part on this, you know, Brandon Ingram, I believe reevaluated this Friday. There's not an update on his return. Maybe there'll be one, but they do have a short runway for working him back into the rotation. And to me, there's a handful of teams that have this circumstance where there's a big key player. Maybe it's OG Ananobi with the Knicks, you know, obviously Ingram here. There's some teams that the runway is going to be so short, but so important because Ingram complete there. I think the, the, the Pelicans are one of the worst teams in the clutch. And a lot of that is you need Ingram in theory provides them a lot more of a dynamic option in the clutch. They're going to need that in the postseason. Oh, but no if he doubt. comes back legs and gets two games under his belt and then goes yeah. right into a play in, that's just so tough. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to get talk about another guy in that same boat here in a second and Joel Embiid and, you know, yeah. and, and the likelihood that they can hit the ground and get up to full speed as quickly as they're going to need to to impact the first round. That's what we're really talking about here. And the same thing with the Knicks. And like what Josh Hart said to me was very telling. He talked about, you know, I don't know when these guys are coming back. I, I, at this point, yeah. I think he said something like, I'm expecting them not to. It kind of gives yeah. you an insight because he's, he's behind the curtain every day to see what's going on back there. So that's a good point. You know, Ingram, the one thing about Ingram is the nature of his game is is sort of getting to the getting to those middies right and and pulling up and lean backs and shooting over guys and i feel like he could ramp that up pretty quickly uh and and be be a threat but the question is how quickly you know does he start off slow in a series and they're down 2-0 it's, it's pretty much toast at that point so that's what we have to find out how much time is he going to have is it going to be enough time what level does he get to and then you know if he gets playing well before they start the playoffs that's another interesting team for somebody to get in the first round, no doubt. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. On the other side, we're going to quickly hit on the Bulls and the Hawks before getting to some of these women's games. And then, of course, talking about the, uh, the seeding battles in both the West and the East. There's some very interesting ones. We'll quickly touch on all of those. First, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped. You guys know for the last couple of weeks, I've been telling you about the Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0, their best ever blade, and uh, that'll help you with men's below-the-belt 
grooming. But did you know one man every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer among men aged 15 to 35. With April being National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, our friends over at Manscaped have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help spread awareness for men's health and early can uh, cancer detection. Visit manscaped.com slash TCS to learn how to check yourself for ev for early signs of cancer. And as always, use that promo code ALLMBA for 20% off plus free shipping. In, a in addition to providing the right tools and solutions and a comfortable and easy grooming Manscaped experience, Manscaped is committed to raising awareness and giving support to fighters, survivors, and families impacted by cancer. This is why they will be donating $50,000 to TCS, the Testicular Cancer Society, help save lives by going over to manscaped.com slash TCS and sharing their funny educational check yourself video. And while you're at it, grab 20% off plus free shipping when you use that code all MBA, A-L-L-M-B-A. Because like a famous American philosopher once said, take care of your mentals, your balls, and your chickens. I'm not sure a famous philosopher said that, but maybe they did. Uh, we're also presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook app, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into 150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. You can get absolutely reckless and bet on the 11-seeded NC State. My Wolfpack, you can get reckless there. Or you can play it extremely safe and take UConn, who looks like an NBA team with how they execute. Either way, whether you win or lose, you bet 5 bucks, you win 150 Instantly in bonus bets. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use that code A L L M B A. New customers get five or bet five bucks, get 150 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code All NBA. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Or in West Virginia, visit 1 800 Gambler.net. In New York, call 877 8 Hope and Y or text Hope and Y 467 369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash b ball for eligibility and deposit restrictions terms and responsible gaming resources all right back here segment two of the all nba show hit that like button if you're watching live hop in the live chat you can always send questions super chats different thoughts or just talk to other people while legs and i are breaking down some of the games we're going to move over now and talk about the atlanta hawks beating the chicago bulls this is a game again we try to cover all the teams that are in the playoff play in in that this time of year this was a battle that was important because these, these two teams are right neck and neck in the standings. You think the Bulls should have the upper hand playing at home, but they fall in large part because Veet Krejci, the <laughs> hottest shooter in the NBA last night, not named Devin Booker. He goes off for a career high. He actually had a career high in the first half of this game. He hit one three in the second half, but he had 18 points on six of six from three. Legs, what did you see from this game and were you impressed with it? Veet Krejci? Yeah, listen, man, I was watching Caitlin Clark until I heard what he was doing. I switched over. I was like, I got to watch this creature, dude, man. He's on fire like that. Um, six for six, man. You can't do any better than that. It was it, – listen, yeah. this game was interesting because, you know, you couldn't watch them all, so I kind of went back and tried to watch it. I thought, let's, let's, you know, let's watch the second half. Nothing really remarkable happened, Adam, in that you kept waiting for a Bulls run that just never came. The, the Hawks got up double digits in the third quarter, and they pretty much just kept them at arm's length the rest of the way. And it was a important game for the Hawks. And just to, to, to put a little more emphasis on what you said about why would a game like this even matter? They're, they're pretty much, you know, it's, it's all determined now. Like no one's catching either one of these two teams from behind it's over. They're right. going to be, they're going to be nine and 10. And so what then mattered about last night was where's that game going to be played, right? Cause one of those teams is going to host that game and it's going to give you a better right. chance at home. Obviously, if you basically have the same record, you want to play that game at home, and so right now, Atlanta's a half game behind Chicago. So Atlanta, right as of today, would have to go on the road and play at Chicago. And that's why that was a big game. They, they narrowed the gap with them. And it gives you just a better opportunity. Now, if you come out of 9-10, you're going to have to win two games to get out of the play-in. But at least one of those games could be at home. And that's what the importance of that game was. Yeah, and it's funny because these two teams, to me, seem like the same team. Or they're at least in the same spot. I'm not sure where they're going. 
They have some veteran players that you're like, okay, it's not really a building block. They have some young players, but you're like, it's not really a rebuild. And so it's kind of ironic that they're right there in the standings and fighting. I think the the funniest outcome, and I don't mean this, that not trying to be cruel to these two fan bases. The funniest outcome is they both just end up missing the playoffs, which is probably the most likely. And that, that game ends up not mattering. But one other note on this one, and Emma, I think we have the clip here. Bogdan Bogdanovich, up 20 points, seemed to have a problem with his coach, Quinn Snyder. Take a look at this one here. He's obviously clearly frustrated. He gets up. They're up 15 points here. He gets right nose to nose. Teammates have to come in and tell him what's going on. Now, I don't know. And after the game, you know, both sides of this kind of talked about, oh, you know, it's just competitors. You can go ahead and take that off there. Just competitors, you know, the heat of the moment, the heat of the battle. But I always find it weird when this happens to in a game when a team is dominating. They were up a lot and this happened. Not speaking necessarily just to this specific moment, Legs, but, you know, these are competitive people the heat of battle, all those different things. But what can you say about these moments when a player and coach get nose to nose in each other's faces? Well, at first I agree with you. The context is a little bit strange. Up big and he had a great game. So <laughs> what's the problem here? Like, wh why are we upset again? What, what's going yeah. on? Who knows? I mean, obviously I can't begin to speculate on what happened. Something, something was either said or a substitution was made or whatever. Something mm -hmm. along those lines had to be. Um, and Bogdanovich took exception to it. It's really not that uncommon. It's it's these things are caught now every time the full extent of these are caught on camera. Um, and so they're going to be talked about more uh, than they were when I played, when stuff like this happened all the time. It just necessarily wasn't didn't have a camera honed in on your huddle right. at all times. Right? It's the truth. And so stuff like that would happen. And, of course, it happens in the locker room all the time. Not a big deal. I do think – I do think coaches today have a much, much greater ability to brush this stuff off and, and treat it as a one-off and move on and go back to coaching the guy. Normally nothing's held against you. No grudges, no impact on you. Then when I played, I felt like the different eras, like th th that was something that could have some carryover for a player. Now, not a star, but we're only talking about a couple of those per roster. Most everybody else is filling a role. And those guys, yeah, there could be some carryover, man, or some lingering tension between between your player and coach. I saw that happen. I think coaches are better now about – because it's more of a player league than ever. They have more control than ever, and I think coaches have done a pretty good job of walking away from that. Now, there are some guys with certain personality types that could have escalated last night right there yeah. in the moment, right, easily. And we could name a few, right? That could have That could have gotten – out of hand, but I think in general, coaches do a better job of kind of just letting that vent happen. Boom, it's over. Let's move on, and um, and there'll be no lingering effect going into the next game. Did you ever get in a coach's face in your in, in your NBA career? Uh yeah, I did. I did Mul multiple times. I did. I okay. did a couple of times. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and in in one case, it's funny. I actually got into a fight in practice. Um, that was a direct result of my anger toward my head coach. And I was so seething. And then it was like practice was over and, and then some guys had to stay and we were playing some three on three and it got very heated because we weren't a very good team. You had a lot of guys that were unhappy in that locker room. So now you're going to make guys do extra work that are all in a bad mood. And this is what it's going to lead to guys. It became literally became like an absolute street brawl, these three on three games and then ended up leading into a fight where I threw a punch and it was it was all because of the coach. It was all because right. of him. And it's you know it just gets taken out another player because of the state of mind that you're in. But yeah, I, I had a couple confrontations coming out of games or coming off the court one time in a film session, definitely because what what was being um, what was being described, what we were watching, and what the root cause of a problem was in a particular film we were watching was so far from what the actual problem was that I had to say something in that session and it turned into a little bit of an argument. Um, so yeah, it happens. I, most, not, I shouldn't say most, I shouldn't say most players. Cause there definitely are a lot of players that have a certain demeanor. It would never happen ever. Um, I was a little bit, I had a little bit more of a fiery type personality that way. So I had a few moments throughout legs, my career. Legs, we know just yesterday we, you, you almost got in a fight with uh, some dads over the Easter eggs, man. Like we know legs has some fire in him. 
Listen, man, you have no idea how close I came. I mean, I almost heard somebody like hit the bell. Somebody hit that bell right now because it's on right here in this field. The Easter Bunny watching and everything else. It's about to go down um, with some of the behavior of some of these parents. So you're right, man. My, my blood runs hot. My blood runs hot. I'll be the first to admit it. But uh, fortunately, yeah. that didn't escalate. There's a funny viral video of somehow a guy in an Easter Bunny costume in a real street fight. Like somehow something happened and a guy that's in an Easter Bunny had to hop in and he's just laying haymakers on some guy. You don't want to get your ass kicked by a guy in a, a bunny costume, man. I'll tell you that. Let's move on. Um, let's talk about this playoff picture. I have the most interesting seating battles in the NBA right now. I identified three of them and I put them in order. I think the number one most interesting seating battle is the Cavs, the Knicks, and the Magic. I think it's the most interesting one because there's the most at stake for these respective teams. The Knicks and Cavs have had great seasons all year. Orlando's been a surprise team. And yet the order of that could completely flip. And then who you're playing in the first yeah. round, you know, there's a big difference, in my opinion, between Philadelphia, who bringing back Joel Embiid later this week, it looks like. You got the Miami Heat, who are tough, the Pacers. I think the battle for those three spots, the difference between three, four, and five is so important. And at this very moment, I'm not sure who's going to win that race. I think you could make a case. Now, on playoffstatus.com, they do these projections for who's supposed to win. The Cavs currently have the best odds. Uh, and the Knicks actually both have a 28% chance at that four seed. So they're kind of calling it a tie right now. And then the Magic still open 27% chance. Man, I didn't realize this. 28, 28, and 27% chance for those three teams. Almost even for all three of them to get that three seed. That's a great race. I think, you're, I think you've hit it. Um, I've been looking at this for a while. And you think about the difference between three and five, what that means. Okay, first, you're three. You're hosting that first round series. And most likely going to be able to avoid – Philly, right? Philly, you know, Miami. So you get a team like Indiana, which I've said repeatedly won't be, wouldn't be easy to play, but certainly I think you'd prefer playing them over Miami or Philadelphia. Um, and then you would then get probably the Bucks in the second yeah. round, right? right? So you avoid Boston. So if you go to five, not only are you on the road in the first round, um, against a problem, you know, a, a very difficult team to play. You then immediately your reward if you somehow escape that is to play the Boston Celtics. So that's what's at stake in in that half or that one game difference between three and five right now. That's what's at stake. So I completely agree with you. I think that is the most fascinating race to look at down the stretch. I do you have a, a thought on on how you think this like which of those three teams do you have the most confidence in in closing? Because the Knicks would have been my answer, but the Knicks they're just so short-handed right now, and I feel a little worn down that I almost would place them third at this very moment just because of that. Yeah, you know, look, and and look, Donovan Mitchell, you know, the Donovan Mitchell factor with Cleveland yeah, he's has kind of limited them. Like, they're, they're not quite the same. Does Orlando actually have the inside track, <laughs> even though they're a game back? Right now, they're certainly, I think, the most whole relative to what they are at their best as opposed to Cleveland and New York, there's no doubt. I agree with you at the Knicks. I, I think Jalen Brunson's usage right now is a problem, man. They don't have a second legitimate offense generator, you know, and that's what Randall comes in. And it, it's not looking good for him. And you know, Jalen Brunson would have to take literally 25 to 30 shots in every single game in the playoffs. Man, that's tough. That is tough yeah. for a guard to have to do that much just to try to keep you in games. Look, their defense and their competitive will will always give them like a chance. And you hope that, hey, they're close enough that Brunson can be great in the fourth quarter. But that's just a heavy burden to carry, man, for four quarters every night, every game, without having a second guy that you can give it to that's going to win one-on-one -on -one matchups or draw double teams. That's where Julius Randle comes in and not having him. Maybe it does tip the scales in favor of the Magic. The second most interesting battle to me – is actually the top of the Western Conference. You've got the right. Oklahoma City Thunder, Denver Nuggets, and Timberwolves uh, all within one game of each other. The Wolves and Nuggets play each other. This one's really good. The only reason I put it second is I is we don't know how the bottom of the West is going to shake out, so it's almost a little less predictive of what's going to be most or less least favorable, but obviously home court matters in this one. But this one, again, we look at the odds. The Nuggets are the Thunder have the best odds, 46% to win the one seed. 
The Nuggets and Timberwolves almost evenly split at 35 and 34% for the two seed, respectively. So I think this one could go to either three, either of the three teams. The Thunder keep winning, so I kind of think they're they're in pole position, and I think they're going to hold on. What do you see from this battle? You know, the, the most interesting thing, and look, it's impossible to you know sit here and try to predict how it's going to turn out with without right. literally going game by game and trying to figure out like win loss, win loss, and then maybe you come up with a number. It could go any one of, of, of three different ways, but the interesting part of it is the fallout for the other teams that are going to have to play these three teams right. and not knowing where Denver is going to be. Like how much easier it would be to sort of, sort of strategize if you knew that Denver had it locked up the way Boston does. And then you just know like, man, at all costs, let's avoid four or five. Like we know then where we got to finish, but um, those teams at the bottom don't know. You know, and, yeah. and that's what's that's what's interesting. Cause I, you know how I feel about Dallas. I think they're the biggest threat to Denver right now. Um, yeah. And but what if they play them in the first round? Yeah, that would be, that, would, that would be bad. I think for NBA fans because that could lead up to something incredible if those two teams met up. But I don't know how, man. I, I wish I could handicap that. I really don't know how you do it. This is why do you get to this time of the year, Adam? I just can't wait until we get to the end <laughs> of the season. I really can't, man. All these yeah. hypotheticals drive me insane because you're wrong about 99% of them, how it's going to turn right. out. So it's just like, let's just cover it day by day and let's let the chips fall where they may on the uh, Sunday, the 14th at by like 6 PM. We'll, we'll know everything. And this is why the third and the last most interesting battle is just the avoiding the play in, in the West. Yeah. And yeah. I think right now the Clippers are pretty much a lock. I mean, unless they completely melt down here, they're a lock to miss the play in and just make the playoffs. I think Dallas with the way they're playing and the fact that they are up a game and a half out of the play in means that I would call them as close to a lock without being a lock as you can get. But that means New Orleans, the Suns, the Kings, those three teams. And then of course, a little bit of Dallas, one of those teams is going to avoid the play in. And that's massive, especially when you look at Sacramento, they're shorthanded. Do they want to go into a play in where they have to beat the Suns on the road? And if not, you have to face the Lakers or Warriors. That's tough. And if you're the Phoenix Suns, look, we talk about them. They're explosive. Do you really want to get into a, a moment where you have to win a game or you have to win games to get in? I just think there's a really, really good team in the Western Conference that's going to fall into the play-in and be fighting for their lives right from the jump. And oh, by the way, you win the first round of the play-in and you get Denver as the 2-7 matchup. It's just that battle, the, the end of the regular season is going to be its own playoff for those teams because of how important it is to avoid that. Yeah, and you know it. It's that's also we didn't talk about the Lakers and Warriors, who are the other two teams down there. And I think Golden State looks like they're safe now. Um, yeah, with the way things played out the other night, that's a big swing. When they win, Houston loses. Kind of put that to bed. I feel like because they have the tiebreaker, that's going to be tough to, for Houston to pull that off. Now they kind of stalled their momentum. But you got the Lakers and Warriors sitting there, right? And they're very likely are going to play a one game playoff to to advance to to the next play-in game, um, yeah. right, against the loser of the 7-8. You have two teams. Look, and I think the Lakers – excuse me, Lakers are more dangerous than Golden State uh, in terms of, like, sustaining yeah. something um, because of the dominance of Anthony Davis. Uh, that You know, that's just different for them. So – but that's – you know, that's a fascinating thing. LeBron, Steph, who have defined, you know, this generation really in this era, this this rivalry that they've they've sort of had – uh, to have to play one game to send somebody home and not have a postseason with that guy included is pretty interesting. Um, that'll be an interesting one. All right, let's move on. Let's close out today's show by talking about Caitlin Clark, the Iowa Hawkeyes beating LSU. We'll also get to the UConn-USC USC game, but this is a game, Legs, that carried its own prestige, its own excitement. All of the basketball world was following this game last night, and for good reason, it lived up to the hype. It was a phenomenal game. And Caitlin Clark put her stamp all over it with her dominant performance. What what stood out to you about this one? Yeah, yeah. This first of all, you're right. These games rarely do deliver everything, and this had it all. So it had a little bit of spice going in, which yeah, I love. You, you sprinkle some of that in there, right? And, and I know Caitlin. I mean, uh, Angel Reese tried to defuse that before the game, and hey, we don't hate each other, whatever. Come on, man. There's some serious animosity there. We know it's there between the teams, between the coaches, between the fan bases. Everything's there. So just that's it. The build up to it was great. And now you've got let's give me something where the star players deliver. They both did. Certainly, certainly Caitlin Clark got got the best of that. Um, and then the, the final component, I always feel like I need to have a role player have like one of those special nights. And I thought Kate Martin did it. 
and at fault there also did it, but Kate Martin particularly, because she's a good player, but she was doing things I felt like were above her pay grade offensively that were just enough to help Caitlin Clark sort of manage that game. So that, that's one right. thing that stood out. Secondly, I can't overstate how great her performance was because of everything at stake, right? The, the pressure, the scrutiny, the magnifying glass, the moment, this particular team and the game plan designed to stop you, which wasn't great, by the way, but they, that's what you're expecting. For her to slow everything down on him to the extent that she did and make it look that, she, I would I call it almost pit, pitching a perfect game. Every read she made was the right read. Every shot she took was in the flow. Nothing was forced. Every pass was a precise delivery that led directly to offense. Every single ball handling move that she made, whether it was a behind the back, between the legs, a spin, or a hezzy, all had a specific purpose. Either create space for a shot, create a window to pass it, or create a lane to drive. There's no wasted motion or effort with her in that game last night at all. Very serious, very businesslike. And just greatness elevating itself when the situation requires it. That's what you saw out of Caitlin Clark last night, man. She was mesmerizing. And that little three-point barrage she had with those three threes that got the separation in the third quarter was just incredible with the distances she was shooting from, man. And I said this, Adam, too, one last thing. People were asking, what's the most amazing thing about her offensively? And I'm like, the fact that she shoots so many shots when she separates going to her left – and yeah. then the defender closes hard on her right hand. They're coming at her right, the right side of her body. And it feels like their hand is like right there in the area where she's lifting the ball off the floor and she's unfazed. It doesn't affect her and it, it requires a much greater level of concentration. You know, any right handed player, the defender's closing on my left side, man. I, I, it, if my right hand is completely free and I know they're not going to get there, my goodness, the freedom you have as a shooter. Mm -hmm. Totally different story when somebody's closing on this side of your body and you're raising up and they're right there in your space. She's unaffected by that. And that blew me away last night, man. She had a number of those threes where that's where the defender was trying to make up the ground and it didn't affect her at all. That's why it's funny that you said she didn't force anything. I think the difference between forcing a shot and not forcing it is did it go in? Because some of those threes she took in the third quarter were insane. They just went in. So so you say, if she misses that one, you go, okay, you forced that one. It was a 35-footer step back to your left. But when you make them, you go, great shot. That's what she does. She's incredible. She really does live up to the high. I know there's a lot of hype around her, but she really yeah. does live up to it in all facets of it. And the part you keyed in on, it, it, you kind of went very quickly, but I think it's the most important part. She is a maniac. And I say that with affection. We know this word Mamba mentality. It's It's been overused. We've gone back and forth about the validity of it. She's somebody that I say, there's validity to this. She has such an intensity about her. You said, oh, they diffused the grudge. I They diffused it publicly. They, there's toxicity that comes along sometimes with rivalries where people will try to inject these other aspects of that rivalry into it and talk about the different dynamics. But I think when you just talk about competitors on the court, Caitlin Clark remembered last year. She remembered how that felt and everything about it. And she had this intensity about her in every aspect of it that was maniacal. I'm going to say something about her, a couple things. And I love this because people lose their minds because they think you're giving hyperbole and I'm not. Last night, I'm watching her. The comparison to this point when you when you make the comparison to the men's game and, and, and professionals, it's obviously Curry because of the shooting range, right? And it, it's the, the eye candy from that distance. Like Curry's the first guy to kind of do that consistently at that level, at that efficiency. Caitlin Clark's doing it on the women's side. Last night, that wasn't a Steph Curry because you think about this. She doesn't move without the ball, Adam. Rarely. Right. Falls in her hand. Every, all her work is done after she gets it. So guess who I'm going to say she reminded me of last night more so than Curry with her combination of scoring and facilitating and just being directly leading to offense. When, when it's passed to you, I expect you to shoot it. That's why I gave it to you at the time that I did. And then my scoring prowess. It was Luca. That was more Luca <laughs> than Curry. It was. Like the way that she played, every possession was like she was controlling everything about it. And she's not moving much without the ball at all. 
It's going to be after I get it. Now I'll do my work very much like Luca. You don't see Luca get a whole lot of back cuts or run the floor right. and transition and get to the rim, man. Nothing's happening until he gets his hands on it and he starts putting it on the ground. And that's kind of how Caitlin played last night. And then the other thing, the ultimate compliment you can give an athlete is when their presence and their greatness raises interest to the level that Caitlin Clark has done for the women's game. Right. Yeah. And and you think about that. Think about what like Tiger Woods did for golf with his what he did yep. to elevate that. And think about what like what he meant to Nike in terms of their golf division didn't exist before Tiger Woods. And what what he did to elevate interest in any event he was participating in. Caitlin Clark has elevated interest in the women's tournament, unlike any player that has ever come before her. That's the ultimate compliment that you can give because not only are you raising interest, you are delivering in a massive way. Think about this. There have been two 40-point, 10-assist games in the history of the women's tournament. She's had them in back-to-back -back years in the Elite Eight to get to the Final Four. What else, what else can wild, you say? Man. It's like the ultimate, the ultimate uh, performance when you have to have it at the highest level because that's what's going to be required. Now, the question is, can she have you know two more of those in her? I think she's just an all-time competitor, and I and I'm not saying that lightly. There's there all the professional athletes, college athletes, most of them are competitors, true competitors. But there's this other level of just uh, of people that are kind of crazy. To be honest, I almost don't envy them because it does elevate you, but it can also drive you drive you mad. And she plays with an intensity that almost feels joyless in a lot of parts. You know, we talk about some players play with joy. She's happy after the game. She looks hey. thrilled after the game, but during I it. Want yeah, and one last point I want to make on this. Kudos to dad. Dad <laughs> got in her grill in yeah. that first game, right, with, of the yeah, tournament when down. she was just oh, so upset and, like, her emotions were so exposed yeah. for her opponent to see. And, like, that, that makes you look vulnerable. You look frustrated. You look irritated, agitated. It's, it's a, you're draining your team. And dad barking at her from the stands, like, knock it off. He's like, listen, well, you yeah. come on. She has been much better. Look, she's always going to have a little bit, again, it's actually a pretty good comparison with Luca. She's always going to have some of the hands up all the time, like on a non -call. Very expressive. Not, nothing to the extent in these last two games that she did in the first two. So she reined that in because I think she understood this is actually not a positive thing for my teammates right now. I'm bringing negative attention to something and it's, it, it, it's, it's distracting. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to trim the fat on that. And she has done it and she's been laser focused as a result. Well, cue that outro music, Emma. I, I will say last night watching that game, it, it kind of made me think about Kobe and about Gigi because we know that Kobe and he had said, our goal is this is a, she is special. Her drive is special. And I always think there's these great players that come along and inspire the next generation. She would have been a high schooler now, you know, about ready to go into that. And I just think the Caitlin Clark, you know, leading into that next generation that would have included her. It made me think about, it made me almost sad to think about it because I just know Kobe would have loved the intensity she played with. My God, she has Kobe's presence you know the way she commands her team and looks at her team it's it just made me think of that a little bit yeah tragic man that's a good point yeah. uh everybody we appreciate you hanging out with us talking a little hoops we ventured outside the nba today we do have a super chat from frank he says do you believe the rumor of pelicans wanting to shed money to, to be true pelicans are notoriously known to avoid paying the luxury tax like do you have a thought on this i don't yeah i wish i knew i i mean i would hate to give an answer to something I just don't have any idea if that's going to be their MO going forward it seems like going to be a difficult thing to pull off if you've got Zion on your roster like you you sh you know I mean that's the ex expectations from your fan base are going to be there so that's going to be a hard thing to avoid I think one thing the Pelicans have going for them is that there is a war chest of assets I mean I hate referring to people as assets but they have a lot of players that I think every team wants even a Dyson Daniels, you know, player like Jordan Hawkins. They have guys that if you have to reduce your salary but still bring in a good player, I think you're going to be able to do that. So it's, look, the nature of teams like New Orleans is they don't make a ton of money. That ownership group has to be smart. They're not the Knicks. They're not the Lakers. They're not just rolling in dough. They've got to be smart about it. But you know what? They have enough pieces that they can survive. That's my quick take on it. Everybody, appreciate you hanging out with us. Legs is off rest of the week, but I'm going to be back with some special guests throughout the week. 
Two more weeks left in the regular season. They should be a really exciting and important finish for a lot of teams. Hit that like button. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Like the mayor, 